So we're going to talk about mesh generation, and this is going to be a short workshop, and then a, sorry, a short lecture, then a short workshop, and then we're going to talk about um, refinements on mesh generation, and then um, another workshop on that, and then some concluding thoughts for the day. So um, what we're going to do in the next bit is we're going to look at the common terms that um, when we're looking to um, display things like there's a mesh on the right side of the, the screen right there and it's got the black dots those are the, the cell centers and um, they're by default they're not on but we can show you by knowing the right name that helps you find how to turn it on um, so that's the common terms um, we'll talk about mostly how to create a mesh we'll talk about some of the limitations um, some some of the problems that can happen and um, the we'll look at the hydraulic property tables that are part of this process the common terms to describe a mesh are, um, we got a section of it over here and we've got a blue line on the outside. So that's the perimeter. And um, then there's the black dots in the middle and then there's the red dots. The red dots we call face points and the lines in between face points we call faces. And um, they, in this case, the faces that are in the kind of the middle part of that domain, they all just have uh, two points. They're just straight lines. But they don't have to. You can put your own. They could have uh, multiple lines in there. Um, you can't add them yourself. You have to add them kind of indirectly. And that's what the break line business is about. Um, but the faces on the perimeter will kind of naturally often have more than one point, like, like like we can see there. So how do we go about making that? Um, the mesh generation, the procedure um, can start with a random polygon and then a basket of points. And usually you start with a basket of like, you know, a regular mesh uh, offset of points, say, just give me, you know, a, uh, a lattice of 100 by 100 feet or something. And that's a good starting point. Um, and what that'll do is it'll go and generate all the points to, that meet that criteria. And then it clips the ones that are not inside the bounding perimeter. And that's what you're left with. Or that's, where we're, that's the starting point. But you could start with a random um, uh, not random, but um, you could just paste in the points if you had them generated some other way. And we'll see a screen on that later. But seeing as how they can all be kind of random, that we need to figure out their connectivity because we don't. There's no. There's no order or anything to them. They're just all. Here's a. Here's a perimeter. Here's a bunch of points. In this case, the um, the black points in in this on this diagram on the right are the ones for the um, the cell computation centers. So what we do is we do a, there's kind of two things we're looking at right there. One of them is a Delaunay triangulation. So that's the black things. So the, the and that Delaunay triangulation, we figure out the um, optimal, according to the Delaunay criteria, uh, triangles that will um, connect the mesh all together. Um, and that's the first part of the process, establishes connectivity. Um, the second part is we make what is called a, a Veroni diagram. And what that does is it um, attributes all of the area in the in the in the tin to one of the computation cells. So, um, actually, can you guys see my mouse while I move it? I'm not actually sure if you can or not. These are the first lecture in this in this new world. Um, yeah, we can see it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Anyway, so that's good. Um, so if we if we consider this black dot right here. Um, and this black dot right here. Uh, if you were interested in finding out what is all of the 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 all the area, what is the? If I were to consider this like a infinite dart board, where I threw a bunch of darts into this thing, and I wanted to define a region that was the closest, all the all the area with this cell would be the closest area to this point here. And if you think about what happens with the Delaunay triangulation. Um, we could we have a, a line that goes from this cell center to this cell center, and if we bisect that line and go right to the middle of it, and then draw a line perpendicular to it, and then do the same thing with all the other lines. So here's this this vertex here it goes from there to there. We draw bisect it, and then go horizontal perpendicular to that, and we go from this one to this one perpendicular to that. Same thing here to here perpendicular to that. Then we go all the way around. And then we get this side over here, and that looks a little bit funny, but actually the rules are exactly the same, that we go from this cell center to that cell center, draw a perpendicular line, but that's actually this line. So the intersection of the, of the line between them, that cell center vertex, or that cell center location right there, we need to go perpendicular to it, and that represents that face right there. But it's kind of it's weird to think about, but that, 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 that vertical portion in between does not have to be uh, does not have to intersect this 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 segment right here. Um, 
because if we were to consider like this point right here, well, that is actually closer to this cell center. So this, all the region right here, all that goes to the cell. So that's how we make the cells. So we make a Veroni diagram and it has the following properties. We establish connectivity with uh, triangulation and then we go from cell center to cell center, bisect them, draw perpendicular offsets to them and, um, and connect those dots together. And if you know about, that is all you need to know about how cell centers are made or how the triangulation is done in our mesh generation. If you happen to know about Delaunay triangulation, then I can offer that uh, there's another property of a um, Delaunay triangulation, which is it finds these circumcircle centers. This is part of how Delaunay triangulation works. Is, is these red dots right here, you could come arrive at them the same way we talked about before is if I drew a line from here to here and went perpendicular and then same thing perpendicular here where they intersected uh, that is a couple properties and one of them is that if you drew a circle around um, from this point right here it would intersect this this uh, well it would make a the circumcircle for this triangle um, would be this point right here and further it would contain no other points. No, no, no other black points. That's kind of what it means to be a Delaunay triangulation. Okay, a little bit off on a tangent there. That's part of how the math all works. So we end up with a mesh that is a, a complete topology, meaning that all of the area is covered and it's all attributed to one of the cells. And there's one cell center per cell. Um, and when, when that doesn't happen, that we don't have a cell center in a, in a cell, that is always comes about when we're trying to impose other boundary conditions like the perimeter or the break lines. The pure points where you just dump in um, the the triangulation that always, you know, that always mostly works. Um, it's it's where we try to impose the boundary conditions where we end up with having problems where they're not enforced. And um, so you'll see in our documentation that we say faces are also enforced with internal break lines. You see enforced is in quotes, and that's because it's it's kind of more of a guideline. It's something we want, but we don't always get what we want. And I think there's a song about that. Um, let's see. How to go about doing it, how to, how to create them in Rash Mapper. Um, meshes are generated from a set of computation points with, uh, with consideration to polygon and break line. So the polygon is the perimeter line. Um, these steps are listed in order of a perimeter polygon, computation points, which are, you could hand enter them all, you could paste them in from a table, but usually we use a, an automated approach to put them in a, a specified offset. Um, break lines and then refinement regions. And it turns out that you could do any of these things in any order because we don't really make the mesh until we have all that stuff there. Um, but uh, this is a good order, a good way to think about the problem. Um, and the last thing right there, it says that uh, creating good mesh is an iterative process. So it's easy to get started, but then you could sp uh, spend some more time and make sure that the mesh is really honoring what you want it to honor. And basically when we say that is, is it honoring the high ground the way on the faces like it should be? And that is a concept that Gary introduced earlier, and then I will introduce it later today, and it will get introduced probably every day, because this is a key concept for our subgrid model. And uh, then uh, our subgrid model uh, paired with the finite volume methodology. And um, as Gary mentioned, the finite volume methodology is, um, uh, it's all about the, uh, the vo you keep track of the volume very precisely, and then we, determine what goes in and out of that volume based on what happens at the faces. And that um, is a, it's a difference between like the finite element approach, because in finite element, we make a strong statement about what is happening inside the shape of the, inter of the whole domain. With the finite volume approach, we say, no, we're only really concerned about what happens to the faces. And it turns out that to be a really good approximation and a really good solution for the kind of problems that we're solving, that we, um, ends up being faster and sta more stable and um, able to handle the kind of things we want to do. Okay, so uh, Cam uh, talked about this yesterday, so I won't go too much into it, but um, when you start out fresh in RASMapper, there will be, um, there, if you started out with an existing project, there might be geometry files or maybe not, but if you wanted to make a new one, you would go to the geometry node and right click and it's got the two things right there. It says manage geometry association. So these are uh, associating a particular geometry with a terrain, because you could have more than one terrain, um, or you could have land cover or things like that, soils data, where you're trying to associate other properties like Manning's end values and um, infiltration and stuff like that. And that'll be um, 
talk about later in the week. Uh, those are the associations. We got another menu option where we can add a new geometry. So if you pick that, um, I, I think it gives the opportunity to rename it right there. It has a default, but you can rename it there too. Um, and then it shows you the one. Then you get then you get an added outline for a geometry. There's nothing in it yet, um, except for I guess you would get the association to the current current terrain, which is handy. That way you don't have to do that. Um, so the first thing you likely you want to do is go into um, edit mode. So you right click on the geometry you're interested, and there could be many. So you um, select it so that it's the purple thing, and then you hit edit. And then the geometry will, a couple things will change. One is there'll be a pen at the, at the, in the tree view at the geometry level. And then there'll be another pen at the particular layer you're editing. So you're editing things graphically, but you can only edit them one at a time or one layer at a time. So, and that's good and bad. It's great if you're trying to be selective, but if you're trying to delete a bunch of stuff, you have to uh, do them one layer at a time. Um, but uh, by far, mostly a good thing. But once you have a, a thing selected, so in this case we have perimeter selected, then we get a different toolbar depending on um, what, what you've got selected over here. And the first two icons are what we're normally going to be tinkering with. And the left one, that's supposed to show a pen like you're drawing something new. And the second one is you're picking something that already exists. So if you want to draw something new, you pick that mode. And then you, your cursor will, as you click and draw, a new geometric feature, in this case perimeters, will be making a polygon. Um, and, it, and it kind of shows you the polygon you've got going while you're editing it. Um, then the second mode is an edit mode. So when, if I were drawing like a polygon that's going to cover this region, I would do something really coarse in, in the basic add mode, and then I would go back and select it again, and then be able to tinker with the, um, and refine the edges kind of as, on, a, on a one to one basis, or easier to do that way. That's my approach. Okay, so I was kind of going over this when we were looking at them, that um, there's the, the the tools across right there. This is the add new, this is the uh, the select, because then I want to um, kind of open it up so I can edit vertexes one at a time, I can add new ones in the middle, and Cam showed that yesterday. And the, and the tools are they're, they're, they're pretty intuitive and pretty handy, it's, it's done well. Um, then there's a um, an undo and a redo, and um, the scope of that is, I think it's just on the layer level right now, we are still tinkering with that. Um, it's undo, redo, is it's, a, it's an ongoing effort. Um, if you want to plot something, it's right here under tools. It depends on what you're editing. If you're picking like the perimeter layer, then the tool will allow you to drop down and jump right to the um, uh, the main editor for the 2D area. So under and when you're adding a new feature, you're always adding to the end of it. Um, so in this case, we're drawing a polyline. Um, so just click, yeah. and again, there is no penalty for going in back and editing it later. In fact, I think there's a great benefit in just kind of doing the uh, a course thing to begin with and then go back in. And what's really nice about the, the editing um, one at a time um, is that uh, you can easily move and you can see what you're gonna get while you're doing it. And, and Cam showed that this yesterday, but yeah, and you guys can tinker with that today. It's, it's nicely done. Um, when you want to conclude a feature, you double click, and that's how you end it. Um, if you just if you start adding a feature and you decide you don't want it, just hit the escape key and then it'll go away. I've, that's a pretty standard operation when you're drawing a couple things and you click double click there and then you click somewhere else and you think, oh, okay, no, actually I want to make something. Hit escape. Um, or I guess you could close it and then edit and delete it too. Um, the pan tool, you can use the shift key or you can use the middle mouse um, or you can just wheel in and wheel out um, to move around while you're doing editing. Well, if, in a hot session of that. Um, if you want to edit some, a line that already exists, then you need to select it. And so that's that second icon. So you can either click on the line or you can draw an area or you can drag a square area and it'll find what's under that. Um, then it'll select it. And if you double click to open and uh, double click somewhere else to close it, uh, then you can move your mouse anywhere along the line, and if you um, if you go in between two vertexes, so we've got a vertex there and a vertex there, and I say I wanted to move, like in this case over here, and draw have a line go more down this way, I can go grab somewhere in the middle, and it doesn't matter where, but when I get close, I get a green dot, and it shows me, and I can drag and pull down, and I can see what it's gonna be, and then when I let go, then it becomes the new addition to the line. Again, it's a, it seems complicated, but it actually turns out to be fairly intuitive once you start working with it. Okay, so, um, now that you've gone and uh, got the perimeter in there in some acceptable shape, um, you can uh, 
right click on the perimeter and there's a menu option that'll take you to the 2D flow editor. And if you've just come in, um, this will all be uh, this will be blank. There won't be anything in here and there won't be anything in there. Um, actually, that might be default on that, I can't remember. But uh, pick your, your default uh, DX and DY. And we set up the editing tools so that you could have a different lattice of X and Y, but it turns out in practice that has not gone super well. So it is suggested that you always use the same DX and DY. Um, if you have like a lab data set that is, you know, substantially going, uh, you know, it's it's just a, a rectangle with so many elements across, then you can get away with having um, a, a very DX and DY. Um, but in the, in the real world cases, I think it's pretty universal to use just square cells to start with. Okay, so just because you've put in numbers right there, that didn't actually make the points yet. Um, you need to actually push the, one of the two buttons from below, and that's the generate computation points. Um, and if you don't have any break lines, then, if, then these, two line, these two functions do the same thing. It'll make a bunch of points in there that meet the criteria of being 200 feet across or 200 feet apart. Um, once you've made one, there's some uh, summary stats of stuff on the right. And it says um, we've got 11,097 cells, and the average faith length is so long, the average cell size is 40,000 square feet, if, or meters if we're in SI. And the purpose of this little data, data over there is one, because a lot of times when you're starting, you're thinking like, well, I've just get a handle on the problem. So start off with 100 by 100, see what you get. If it ends up being 2 million cells, then you think, hey, well, how about 200 by 200, uh, just to get going, and because um, it's really nice to get a to get a get a run in just to get a handle on the problem, that um, get an idea like what time step am I going to be using, how long is it going to take to run, because all these things kind of factor in on. Um, ultimately, you're trying to solve a problem, and you're trying to do the best you can to get the best solution for that, but you also don't want to make this your life work. Um, so. Uh, having a handle on, and one of the things that Gary talked about in his first lecture is it's really easy to come in, change these numbers, and then just run it again and see what you get. Uh, see how long it takes, um, and then start comparing differences and hone in on something that's gonna be acceptable for the needs of your project. And um, what else we got here? Uh, oh, so the way you get out of this menu is if you click in, um, in the 2D perimeter area, if you right-click, then you get this menu, and it says Edit 2D Area Properties. That is one of the ways to get to this menu. There are others. Okay, um, I think we talked about the point spacing and what that stuff means over on the right over there. Um, there is another um, setting right there, and it's got the little sprocket symbol to let you know that that's um, um, some set of parameters. And these are some tolerances that are used in some of the generation, um, in, in particular in the, in the property table generation. Um, so we're going to take the the cells and the faces, and we're going to go out and, and we're going to cut that to as accurate as our terrain is to generate property tables. And um, these uh, tolerances here are set for like real world problems, and for the most part, I think they they do pretty good. So there's a a cell. The first first two parameters right there have to do with um, uh, the minimum area, of the, the generation of the property tables. And one of them says the um, cell elevation volume filter tolerance. So this is trying to um, do a filter along the line so that we can end up with less points. And we have less points in the computation tables then it ends up computing faster than if there's more points. Uh, then the second one says uh, cell minimum area fraction. And that has to do with, um, if you had a cell and had one little tiny hole in it that got filled up really fast, then uh, that is a recipe for instability. I mean, the, the, the program can handle it, but it'll it will have, you have to have short time steps if the cell is gonna fill up really quickly. Um, so one of the ways you can manage that is by saying, let's think about the cell as being uh, on the minimum area in our table. Let's just think about it not being ever less than 1% of the total area of the, of the, of, of the cell. Um, uh, generally, it, like I said, these are properties that work well over a wide range of problems, and you, you don't normally go and tinker with these things. The last couple have to do with um, the filtering that happens on the uh, on the faces, and uh, so there's the the first one's just a vanilla X Y filter on removing duplicate points, and then the second ones have to do with um, property table generation. Um, and I don't think we're going to get much too much into those right now, uh, but you can read maybe. We'll talk about that later in the course, or you can look it up online. Um, I think we're getting close to my 
time allotted for this lecture. Uh, computation points. Um, we talked about putting in like 100 by 100 interval. Then if you hit compute points, you might get something that looks like this. Um, up to where the where the computation points are in, there's a little symbol off to the right that shows like a table or something. If you click that table, then you get this uh, dialog up over here. And you could cut the, cut those points out and paste them into something else, or you could get points from somewhere else and paste them in here, or from another model if you wanted to, another browse model. Um, another way to look at the data that's actually going into computations. Um, another way you could do it is if you're back in the old school part of the VB6 editors, um, it was common. We had a lot of old models that had storage areas. We wanted to convert them into studio areas. So you could just go into the, to the storage area editor, and there's a button on the upper right that says, hey, let's let's start making this thing a 2D area. So you can click that button. It'll take the perimeter of the storage area, move it into the bucket for this, the 2D areas, and then you can start um, working on it just like any other 2D area. OK, so what we're going to do with the hydraulic property tables, this is where the subgrid stuff really comes in that um, Gary was talking about this morning. We're going to compute um, tables to represent the geometry of the system. And the cells are going to get a elevation volume relationship. And the faces are going to get uh, a table that is elevation versus area, wetter perimeter, and Manning's N. And then the computation engine converts that into a conveyance um, versus elevation, and that's how it controls flow um, from face to face um, based on the slope and other criteria. Okay, so if we think about, I think this is on the floodplain near Cairo, Mississippi, that um, it's an ag behind a levee somewhere. Um, that has ag drains in it, and that's what that's what this little channel is right here. And we're concerned about what happens with this. Uh, it's a really large floodplain. It's like 60 miles long. This is the one that the actual that the Corps actually blew the levee up on a couple years ago to uh, relieve flooding upstream. I mean, like literally, explosives and all. Um, uh, but behind that levee, there was a, a big um, ag area, and um, had a, had a, a network of channels to just handle regular rain, rainfall, so it would uh, drain off of it. And if you're interested in modeling like the big Mississippi event when they're blowing up the levee kind of thing, then we're not super interested in those little levee, those little, little river systems in there, but um, but they are handled and water does flow through, this, flow through the system. And I think Gary mentioned over this morning, I can't remember exactly what words he used, but yeah, it's okay in this approach. It does model it in a decent approach. Um, if you wanted to do better, then I might put a break line down to the middle. Um, so that the faces end up being perpendicular to this little channel. Um, but it's a start, and it, it would move through the water in, in the correct manner. Um, OK, so if we consider that cell, what we're going to do is we're going to go compute, convert some property tables. And uh, in, let's see, what do we got here? We have a, um, uh, a, pro a profile. So along one of the faces, this face down here, we cut a we cut a profile from our terrain, which is as detailed as we can do. And that is, if we would if we were to walk from this point right here down to this point right here, it would be we go up a little bit. I mean, not a lot, just a couple of feet, because this is I think this is not a design system. They just like scoop some dirt out and threw it over here. So that's what the piles are on either side. It's not a continuous levee or anything like that. It's not a constructed channel. I mean, it's a dug channel, but it's not constructed embankments. Um, so that's what that would look like. Uh, and then if we went through and converted an area versus elevation, so what we'd be saying is if at elevation 280 here has an, el has an area of about 500 square feet. So if we go elevation 280 here, if you were to measure this polygon from right there under there, that would be that area right there at elevation 280. So that would be about 500 square feet right there. And at elevation 280, it would have a wetter perimeter of about 110 feet or something like that. So it'd be at 110 feet from there down to there and then back up to there. So, I mean, that seems about right, doesn't it? So it went from like 300 to 410. So that seems like about right. And it's only a couple feet deep. So, you know, the fact that you went down doesn't really change the length. It's mostly uh, the top width is pretty close to the wetter perimeter. OK, so that's really what those things are. And you can kind of hand verify them that way, too. Um, there's a couple different ways to get the property tables to be computed. They're not computed right away. You have to ask for them because it takes some time to do that. Um, when you're developing your mesh and in our workshop, we're going to ask you to do it so you can look at these tables. Um, but if you didn't do it and you went to do a run, it would, it would automatically get computed. Um, and they get 
uh, there's time flag stored in different pieces of data so that if you go and move something, the tables are not valid anymore, and then we recompute them automatically. <clears throat> oh, and I, let me back up one slide. So there's something which I don't know if we've talked about yet is that they're stored in the geometry file and says star.hdf. So your geometry file will have a name like um, if your project was called Red River and if it was the first geometry file, it would be called Red River.g01. That would be your first geometry file. And inside would have another name, but that would be the file name. Um, in RAS now, if you haven't noticed yet, is that when we um, we store our new stuff in a file that's got the same name but has it has a .hdf at the end of that, and it's a um, a uh, a new way to store data that's binary and uh, compressed and turbocharged and all that. It's a great way to store things, and it fits our problems wonderfully. And you, there's a viewer loaded on your desktop. You can double click on those .hdf files and take a look and see what's in them if you want to. Um, okay, so we just, we talked about the faces. So the cells has a similar kind of thing. And what we do is we uh, we compute the terrain um, from, in this case, if it's just one raster, that's pretty straightforward. There could be multiple rasters, there could be um, vector rads and or whatever in between. But we get a, a, a DTM just underneath right here. And then we resample that at various elevations and we get a volume versus eleva elevation relationship. And that is what's gonna go into the computations for um, how much it will go up when you add so much water to the cell um, for the volume accounting part of the subgrid vo finite volume analysis. Um, other things on faces. So when you have the, the uh, mesh loaded, and you right-click on the 2D area, it says um, display properties um, or open attribute table. And you come in here and it's got some attributes. It's got uh, the symbology, oh, I guess this is on slide. The symbology is a little bit, it's now stacked, not just across like that. But the options over here are you can turn on um, mesh edges and uh, um, mesh cell numbers. If we turn that on, then we would get the black dots. Um, Mesh face numbers. If we turn that on, then we would get to see. Oh, so we got the face. Here's the face. So, so we can see the direction of the face. Um, and that's generally not important, but if you're interested later in looking in that HDF output file and trying to figure out where water's going there, uh, one from one cell to another, then um, the the orientation of the face matters. And um, it's positive looking left to right. So on if this if this cell is going that direction and flow is going this way, then that would be a positive number. Oh, wait a second, no, that's wrong. Actually, that's the exact opposite of that. Um, uh, I guess we have to look at the documentation, but the orientation matters, and, um, that, is, and that, that can be found in the face. Uh, when you turn on the face numbers, we show the direction as well. Um, mesh face point numbers, if you turn those on, uh, then it'll put a dot right there in the mesh dual tin. So on the first or second slide, I showed you the, uh, and I talked about the Veroni diagram. Um, that is what you would see if you turn on the dual tin. Um, the face profile. Okay, so now if we're going along this face, so this is another reason why it's important to know the orientation, is that if we're going along this, from this point to this point, then we would see this profile. And the profile looks, it looks kind of stair-stepped, right? And you might be wondering, well, what's up with that? Why is that a, this is actually an artifact of that rounding that we talked about earlier. And um, they can mentioned in the previous lecture. And it turns out, so the elevation difference between here and here, it's, it's uh, looks like we're rounded to, I guess we could get a difference between here and here. That is 0 0.2 feet. And so we're on the, a little bit more than that. So might be 1 32nd or 1, 16, so it's probably 1 16th, probably rounded to 1 16th of a foot. Um, uh, Cam alluded to this earlier that uh, you can pick a rounding and you can pick a decimal uh, tenths if you want, um, or you could do um, powers of two. And uh, those options are in there. Um, the powers of two ones, it seems more confusing, but they're in there because they're actually more computationally efficient. Because if you think about how numbers are stored in computers, it's, it is base two. And uh, when you round them, then our compression works better, so the file ends up way smaller. Um, so even though our terrain looks a little bit stair step here, it's, it's not gonna affect the computations at all, and the file size is about half what it would be if you didn't round it. Um, and then there's the, the comparable face property uh, of a face area versus elevation, and then we could also get a 
uh, wetter perimeter. Um, when you're in this mode right here, you can pick a row of them and, and kind of compare them if you wanted to. <clears throat> Um, limitations is that there is one face between cells since it was a dash even on the perimeter. So uh, it's one and only face between cells. So if there's if there's two faces next to each other, there will if there's two cells next to each other, there'll be one face between. Um, but you can end up with a like a, a cell at the end of a um, or corner of a, of a if you drew a perimeter that had kind of an oblong shape and it might just have one cell in the center, then it might only have two faces. One face would be to the other part of the connected part of the system, and the other, and the second, the second perim, the second face would be all along the outside of the perimeter. Um, just to let you know that we don't break that up. It's not by it's not by segment on the perimeter. It's it's where the next uh, competition cell takes over. Um, uh, one boundary cell per face, um, except for a lot of structures where you can actually have them um, start and start and stop on two of them start and stop on the same cell. <clears throat> 